The court notes that the military operation being conducted by Israel following the attack of 7 October 2023 has resulted in a large number of deaths and injuries, as well as massive destruction of homes, the forcible displacement of the vast majority of the population, and extensive damage to civilian infrastructure. It's a bad day for fans of genocide, as the International Court of Justice has ruled against Israel and in support of South Africa's case that Israel must take steps to prevent a genocide in Gaza. So in this video, I will break this down. I will also help you understand why things are worded in the way that they are, because you may question, but there is a genocide going on. Why must they take steps to prevent one that is already happening? I'll help explain all of that, including why there was no ceasefire called as there. The way that this is being framed by some is incredible. So let me actually start with that. This is from the National Post here. This is a Canadian paper and uh, their headline is just incredible. Top UN court rejects South Africa's request to halt war against Hamas. So based on <laughs> the headline here, you would come away thinking, oh, I guess Israel won their case. Yet, if you look at the actual ruling, this is the ICJ's ruling against Israel and in favor of South Africa. 15 to 2, 15 to 2, 16 to 1, 16 to 1, 15 to 2, 15 to 2. All stating that Israel must take steps to prevent a genocide in Gaza. This one state of Israel shall ensure the military not commit any acts of genocide. Israel shall take all measures to punish all public solicitations to genocide. Israel shall take immediate and effective measures to address adverse conditions to life in the Gaza Strip. Israel shall take effective measures to prevent evidence of actions impacting the genocide convention. Israel shall submit to the court all, a report, uh, all measures taken to follow the orders of this court within one month. These are, th th this was clearly a ruling against Israel. And it, it isn't just the National Post that fell into this. I, I'll get to that in a second. But Owen Jones here writing, Israel apologists are pretending that the ICJ had the power to declare Israel's massacre of Gaza a genocide, but refrained from doing so. That isn't true. The ICJ had no power to adjudicate that at this stage. The most they can do was conclude whether genocide is plausible. So in case you're wondering about the wording, why it's talking about measure to, pre to prevent genocide when there is one being, when there was one going on, it's because this court did not have the legal ability to say that there is a genocide happening. So they are simply laying out, hey, these steps must be taken to prevent genocide, which also, I'll get to later, gets to, the, it opens the door for Israel's allies, like the UK, like the US, like Canada, to then use this as the basis for them to take steps to stop their support of Israel with this uh, bombardment of Gaza. So this this allows Israel Israel's allies to not have to come to the defense of Israel because it, let's say for a second that the court ruled that a genocide is happening that immediately now implicates the U.S., the U.K., Canada, and other uh, Israel allies in that genocide. But by saying we want you to prevent a genocide, this opens up the door for the U.S., the U.K., Canada to not be defensive and instead work. Uh, in in support of trying to end the genocide. So work in support of this ruling to try and end it, as opposed to being on the defensive and trying to claim that they're not committing a genocide. So, it, it, you know, it's a little complicated, but it helps you to understand why they're not just outright saying that there is a ge genocide going on. Um, New York Times, this was their initial headline. Adam Johnson sharing the screenshot. UN court declines to demand Israel stop its military campaign. Again... <laughs> This is not, they actually went on to change it because they realized how stupid that was. UN court demands Israel prevent genocide, but doesn't call for a ceasefire. So back on this point about ceasefire, this is very important to note here. Hamas is not a part of the UN. So the, the court cannot, from the court's perspective, they cannot tell Israel to cease all military operations because that would imply that Hamas has to as well, yet they have no jurisdiction over Hamas. So they cannot, they cannot tell Israel to stop their bombardment when there is another member of this conflict that is not part of the UN. So uh, this, is, this is why there is no call for a ceasefire, because they cannot legally call for a ceasefire when one member of that ceasefire is not part of the court, is, is not part of the UN. 
So th this this whole idea of, oh, Israel won out because a ceasefire wasn't called. Th they can't call one. <laughs> they're, 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 this is a legal proceeding. They legally cannot call one because another member of, of that would-be ceasefire is not a part of the UN. Uh, also, as uh, Ali Abunma writes here, this is a legal ruling, saying the word ceasefire wouldn't have magically translated into a ceasefire. This legal ruling contains significant findings about Israel as a perpetrator of genocide. To the extent international law and justice has any un uh, utility, this is a landmark case. So it's just, it's important to note, this is a success for human rights, a success for South Africa's case. This is a ruling against Israel. There is no ability for the court to call for a ceasefire when one, when one member of that ceasefire is not a part of the UN. Now... This is a, just to show you a real headline because it wasn't, you know, this is not thankfully the norm. I'm seeing headlines and news stories that actually properly describe the issue or the, uh, the ruling. But here from The Guardian, UN court orders Israel to ensure acts of genocide are not committed in Gaza. So this is what a proper outlet writes. Now, I want to show you a bit of the video of the ruling. In the court's view, at least some of the acts and omissions alleged by South Africa have been committed by Israel in Gaza appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Convention. In light of the following, the Court concludes that, prima facie, it has jurisdiction pursuant to Article 9 of the Convention to entertain the case. Given this conclusion, the Court considers that it cannot accede to Israel's request that the case be removed from the general list. The Court notes that the military operation being conducted by Israel following the attack of 7 October 2023 has resulted in a large number of deaths and injuries, as well as massive destruction of homes, the forcible displacement of the vast majority of the population, and extensive damage to civilian infrastructure. While figures relating to the Gaza Strip cannot be independently verified, recent information indicates that 25,700 Palestinians have been killed, over 63,000 injuries have been reported, over 360 housing units have been destroyed or partially damaged, and approximately 1.7 million persons have been internally displaced. All right, so I'm going to get to what this could mean, because that's kind of what's next here. But imagine watching that decision and then going to write a headline for a national newspaper claiming that Israel won their case. It is so incredibly dishonest, and you wonder why people have questions about, you know, uh, believing the media. It's, let's be clear here, a lot of conservative media, but also media that is traditionally are viewed as being left or left-leaning, like the New York Times, also writing conservative headlines claiming that Israel won their case when clearly they did not. I mean, they straight up said there that they rejected Israel's request that the case be removed, meaning there was merit to the case, meaning all these rulings against Israel. And also worth, uh, I'll get to that, worth pointing out here, the court's decision are, uh, decisions are binding and cannot be appealed, but it has no way of enforcing them. Israel earlier indicated it would not accept the ICJ's orders, but we will get to potential potentially what it could still mean. The court's panel ordinarily comprises 15 judges, but was expanded in this case by additional judges from South Africa and Israel. Israel's judge, uh, Aaron Barak, an 87-year-old Holocaust survivor and former president of the country's Supreme Court, voted in favor of two of the emergency measures, ordering Israel to curb incitements to genocide and to ensure aid can enter the enclave. When even your own judge, at least in two cases, rules against you, Kind of says something. Now, this is what this, as I was saying earlier, what this could mean, what this ruling, the impact it could have. So Heidi Matthews, who is a, a law professor writing here, I think we can infer from this that at a minimum, there is a serious risk that Israel will commit genocide. This is important because it puts all states on formal notice of the serious risk of genocide, which triggers states duty to take concrete steps to prevent genocide. Going again, why this was discussed in the in the terms of, you know, we want them to prevent genocide when there is one already going on. Is This opens up the door for uh, the for Israel's allies to take steps here. 
Going on to write, among other things, this means that in order for states to fulfill their international obligations under the Genocide Convention, they must do something. Uh, for example, states exporting arms or military technology to Israel must stop. The short story, this order on provisional measures will have an important and immediate impact on how states are required to act under international law. It will also radically shift the global conversation about what is happening in Gaza. So I'm still waiting on, as of recording this, there has not been a public response from Canada, from the UK, from the US. I assume one is going to come down sometime today. So we will see how they move forward with this. But I will get to, in a bit here, in a couple tabs, the uh, reaction from the State Department yesterday to a question about the potential ICJ ruling. And just it's so... It's so wild to watch these spokespeople squirm with questions around this because they know the reality. But uh, as The Guardian writes, it remains unclear whether Israel will comply with the judgment, although it will increase pressure on its diplomatic and military backers, including the U.S. and the U.K., to take a more robust stance to address the humanitarian crisis. So again, this goes to what Heidi was saying. This is the potential uh, fallout from this this ruling. And we're, again, we don't know yet what the U.S. and Canada and others will do, but this will definitely up the pressure on them. Now, uh, there's no point reading this, but this is just the Human Rights Watch and, and their reaction to it, again, in support of what the ICJ is saying and calling to end the uh, civilian suffering in Gaza. And uh, Asal Rod here writing, try to understand Palestinians who are rightfully angry at the absence of a ceasefire. Those inside Gaza are still being killed and those outside watch helplessly. This is a ruling against Israel. Don't let them take away that victory, but don't let anyone pretend it's justice. So it's important to point this out as well. It's, I understand people who are still angered that the court didn't call for a ceasefire. I understand that anger. At the same time, you have to understand that this is a legal proceeding where they simply cannot properly call for one actor to end all military operations and not the other. I, even if you want to argue that this isn't even a war, that this really is just a, a bombardment from one side, the way that this, this entire case has been argued is that this is a war. So within that context, you can't expect the court to rule that one side stop all the all operations when the other side can't, or it, they, they can't be ruled to when they're not part of uh, of the same you know, body. But uh, this as well. So this, Omar Badar shared this. This is great. A tale in three acts. Breaking, U.S. State Department, there, quote, there is no moral equivalence between Hamas and the government of Israel. Netanyahu says nobody will stop Israel, including Hague Court. Hamas says it will abide by any ICJ ceasefire order if Israel reciprocates. There really is a clear divide here. Uh, no moral equivalence yeah, I guess not when you have one side saying that nothing will stop them and the other side saying they will abide by international bodies. And by the way, it's worth mentioning, even though Hamas said this, it doesn't mean the court can then issue that ceasefire ruling because, again, they are not part of that body. We're talking about a legal proceeding. Even if it sounds like the right thing to do, they legally cannot do that when one side is not a part of uh, the UN. Now, I got to show you this. This is just so Ryan Grimm here. You're going to see him reporter a great reporter um, asking this question and it, just watch how the state department squirms and again this is from yesterday before the ruling came down but watch how this exchange goes ryan you've hit your hand up go ahead sure. uh, I want to go back to the icj question yeah. setting aside opining on how the ver how the preliminary verdict might come out would the u.s at least commit to not vetoing enforcement of whatever the court rules one way or the other uh, i'm not going to commit to any action uh from up from up here that's but to not pick up on matt's question works. from earlier do, doesn't that undermine the u.s insist u.s insistence that other countries ought to follow these court rulings what does it leave of the kind of rules-based order if countries can pick and choose decisions that's certainly not uh what uh i was indicating uh Again, I think we need to take a step back here because a uh, decision has not come down and no one uh, here knows, unless you can tell the future, what exactly that will be. This is the quagmire that Israel's allies are now in because either they uphold international order, international norms. They're very concerned about that. The U.S., the U.K., Canada, always concerned about international order, international norms, which they should be. Either they uphold that and agree with the ICJ ruling and then take steps to stop supporting Israel, or 
they undermine international order that they're so, so concerned about and do that to support an ongoing genocide. Look, we're going to have to, I'm still waiting on reactions here from the US, the UK, Canada, but this is the leverage that all of them need to go to Israel and say, hey, we still support you, we still love you, but we have to uphold international norms, otherwise this entire thing collapses. So we're going to have to wait on the reaction here. Canada did say beforehand that even though they disagree with South Africa's case, that they will support the ICJ's ruling. Are they going to follow through? Again, we're going to have to wait. But this is this is really hurting Joe Biden to the point where I keep seeing articles like this. This is another one. Came out a few hours before the ICJ ruling from Axios here. The scoop. Biden tells uh, Bibi he's not in it for a year of war in Gaza. This is the, the Biden White House or Biden campaign, possibly. They've been leaking these sorts of stories to various outlets because they want to put the impression out there that Joe Biden is very unhappy with Netanyahu, very unhappy with this genocide that he keeps funding and sending weapons to. But he's very unhappy about it because they're seeing the just the level of support that Joe Biden's losing, especially among young people, and largely due to this ongoing support of Israel. So they're trying to do what they can around the edges there was one article I read, Biden hung up the phone. He was so angry at Netanyahu. <laughs> and then like the next day, they approved arms to Israel. You can't pretend or claim you're angry with your ally and then continue supporting your ally over the thing you're angry with them about. It just, young people aren't dumb. So there's going to have to be some actual steps taken. And this ICJ... Uh, decision potentially, <clears throat> potentially, again, seeing the un unwavering support for Israel so far from all these allies, it's hard to imagine anything will change. But this, uh, if there's any leverage that they've been waiting for, this potentially is is the time to act and to uh, stop supporting this uh, this ongoing genocide. But we're gonna have to wait to see if they actually follow through on that.